Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Salty Canadian Podcast. This will be a continuation of last week's episode of the Velisca Axe Murders. So we'll be talking about the suspects, the rumors, and the renovation on the house. I would also like to mention that all links will be posted in the show notes so you'll be able to find everything that way. Also a reminder, do not forget to join the Salty Canadian Podcast Rant Room on Facebook. It is our discussion page. There is still not many people so it's not very active so hopefully more people will join. Also I will be releasing a Patreon only episode so you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash salty canadian and just sign up under the five dollar level and that will get you access to that episode which i will be recording soon and hopefully we'll have it out by next week maybe this weekend depending so As always, links will be posted and all that other fun stuff. And I will also be sharing, since I've been neglecting to some of my podcast friends, trailers at the end. So this will probably be a kind of short episode, so I hope you enjoy. So first things first, we will be discussing the suspects in the murders. But since no one was ever convicted of the murders themselves, there never seemed to have been a shortage of suspects. In the days following the crimes, you could have read at least four possibilities in any edition of any newspaper. Many leads, however, were quickly exhausted and... As time went on, it began to dwindle. So basically what we're going to do is just go through the four that, or more that seem to be those actual suspects. So first we have William, a.k.a. Blackie Mansfield, who was arrested in 1916. So, William Mansfield was from Blue Island, Illinois, and was the prime suspect of the Burns Detective Agency of Kansas City and Detective James Newton Wilkerson. According to Wilkerson's investigation, the murder of Joe Moore and the other occupants of the Moore home were committed by Mansfield, who was in turn hired by F.F. Jones. He was also known as George Worley and or Jack Turnbull. And according to Workerson, Mansfield was a cocaine fiend and serial killer. Wilkerson also believed that Mansfield was responsible for the axe murders of his wife, infant child, father-in-law, and mother-in-law in in Blue Island, Illinois, back on July 5th of 1914, just two years after the Villisca murders. Axe murders committed in Powell, Kansas, four days before the Villisca murders and the murders of Jeannie Peterson and Jeannie Miller in Aurora, Colorado. According to the Wilkerson investigation, all of the murders were committed in precisely the same manner, indicating the same person did it. Wilkerson stated 
he could prove Mansfield was present in each of these places on the night of the murders. That would be interesting. In each murder, the victims were half to death with an axe and mirrors were covered in the home. Burning lamp with the chimney was left off at the foot of the bed, the bed and a basin in which the murderer washed and was found in the kitchen. Each case, the murderer avoided leaving fingerprints by wearing gloves, which believed was he believed was strong evidence that the man was Mansfield, who knew his fingerprints were on file at the federal military prison in Levensworth. Wilkerson had managed to convince a grand jury to open an investigation in 1916, and Mansfield was arrested and brought to Montgomery County from Kansas City. The payroll records, however, provided an alibi that placed Mansfield in Illinois at the time of the Bliska murders. He was then released for a lack of evidence and later won a lawsuit that he brought against Wilkerson and was awarded $2,225. Wilkerson had believed that the pressure from Jones resulted not only in Mansfield's release, but also the subsequent arrest and trial of Reverend Kelly. And it goes on to Red Oak in July 15th of 96. Uh, the Montgomery jury, grand jury got down to business here today examining the evidence against William Mansfield brought here from Kansas City, Kansas. Charged with the Villisca axe murders of four years ago, it expected to be there enough evidence evidence to keep the jury busy till Friday when Mansfield will have his preliminary hearing and be defended by his Kansas attorney. R.H. Throp was a restaurant man from Gina Doa and was there today to identify Mansfield as the man he saw in the morning after the murders boarding a train at Clarinda a man said he had walked from Villisca. If this is sustained, it will break down Mansfield alibi. Miss Vina Tompkins of Marshalltown is on her way to testify that she heard three men in the woods plotting the murder of the Moore family a short time before the killings. And it goes on for July 21st, 1916, where it goes that William Mansfield was released by order of District Judge Woodruff at 3 o'clock in the afternoon after a special Montgomery County grand jury refused to indict him for the Villisca Act murders four years ago. The sheriffs had placed him in an automobile and drove into the country and it is supposed that Mansfield Will return would return to Kansas City, Kansas at once. So then we get to Reverend George Jacqueline Kelly, who was arrested in 1917. He was another prime suspect in the Axe murders. He was a traveling preacher. Kelly and his wife settled in Macedonia, Iowa, in 1912 after several several years of preaching throughout the Midwest. In 1917, Kelly was arrested and charged with the murder of one of the victims of the Villisca Axe murders. He was invited to attend the Children's Day exercises at the Presbyterian Church on June 9th of 1912. His presence in Villisca on the night of the murders and his subsequent departure in the early morning of June 10th Tenth made him a prime suspect. He supposedly confessed and made a mockery of law enforcement practices, law enforcement practices at the time, and was withdrawn before his trial began. Kelly's first trial resulted in a hung jury, 
and that he was finally acquitted by the second. And according to the information presented by Kelly and Tammy Rundle, Kelly moved to Kansas City, Connecticut, and finally New York City the remaining years of his life, and he's finally resting. Place is a mystery. So now we're going to go into a little bit about Henry Lee Moore. There was an existed strong possibility that a serial killer was actually at work, and the Wilkinson case against Manfield actually suggested the same. M.W. McClary, a federal officer assigned to the Villisa case, was announced on May of 1913 that he had solved not only the Villisca murders, but 22 others that had been committed in the Midwest around the same time frame. McClary's theory was that Henry Moore, no relation to Josiah Moore, was the serial killer responsible for all the crimes. He was actually commit convicted of the murders of his mother and maternal grandmother in Columbia, Missouri, just months after the murders in Villisca. Moore's family members were killed just as brutally as the victims in Villisca, and his weapon of choice was an axe. Yeah, so it seems like he committed a lot of crimes involving an axe, and during the Villisca investigation, other axe murders also came to light just nine months before the crimes of Villisca. H.G. Wayne and his wife and child and Mrs. A.J. Burnham and her two children were bludgeoned with an axe in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And basically in June 15th of 1912, there was a case in Colorado. So police officials who were in constant touch with the Villisca authorities to find any parallels in the Moore and Burnham Wayne murders, which were difficult to explain by theory that the same person or persons committed both crimes. In Villisca, the murders strung skirts and aprons across the windows to prevent anyone from looking into the house. At the Wayne and Burnham homes, bedspreads were stretched across the windows. In Villisca, he covered the heads of the victims with bed clothing, wiped blood from his axe, and removed stains from his hands, clothing. And this, too, was the case here in Colorado, as well as the doors being locked and an unfastened rear window, which would have been the means of entrance for the axe murderer. Next, we have Andy Sawyer, who was detained by a sheriff in June 18th of 1912. He was a hobo, basically a trained get and otherwise accounted for a stranger. He was also a, a suspect. One such suspect was, like I said, his name was Andy Sawyer. And with the other suspects, there was no links to Mr. Sawyer, but his name came up often in grand jury testimonies. According to one person, Sawyer approached his crew in Crescent at 6 a.m. on the morning of the murder. The murders were discovered. He was clean shaven, wearing a brown suit when he arrived. His shoes were covered in mud and his pants were wet nearly to the knee. He asked for employment and the person needed an extra man and he was hired on the spot. Um, and then... This basically goes on that Sawyer had told this person that he had been in Villisca that Sunday night and just heard of the murders and was afraid he may be a suspect, which is why he left and showed up in Creston. So this person was suspicious and turned him over to the sheriff on June 18th of 1912. And then it just goes on to explain other stuff. Also, according to the person, he looked over and saw such trees south-north of the tracks and basically goes on that Sawyer was arrested for vagrancy and this Oscula sheriff recalled putting him on a train at approximately 11 p.m. that evening. 
those were the main three suspects. There's another one that had a lot of information. His name was Dobrik, so you can actually go on the Beliska website to check out the information there. It's just www.beliskaiowa.com. So now we're going to go into a little bit about the rumors that are going around about the murders. So one was an outrageous headline, which caused widespread fear and panic. So it goes like this, says maniac killed Joseph Moore family. Dr. Hall of Benson, intimate friend of the Moores, discussed crime. Certain it was not a relative or a business enemy. Excerpt from Omaha World Herald on June 12th of 1912. No relative killed the Moores and the two Stillinger girls, according to Byron Hall of Benson. Dr. Hall was immediately acquainted with the Moors and is a personal friend of the Stillingers. Because of this fact, he is in a position to speak with considerable authority. Moore was particularly jovial and good-natured man, the doctor asserts, and his family was religious. The kids were being raised in the church, he says, and so were the two Stillinger girls carefully going over the ground and summing up all the tangible clues he had been able to find. Dr. Hall says he is unable to arrive at a plausible reason for the crime. It could not possibly have been a relative of the family. And he insists that. Here's another one and it's titled, Murderer Was Concealed in Downstairs Closet. Uh, Omaha, Nebraska, June 15, 1912. Miss Rita Johnson of the city, who accompanied by Miss Minnie Moore, a sister of the murdered Joseph Moore, to Beliska Monday, has returned from that place. Had Mr. Moore or Mrs. Moore looked in a closet off from the room where the Stillinger girl slept, they would have seen the murderer and probably have prevented the crime from Ms. Johnson. Several bags of cotton batting found in the closet showed the marks of a man having sat and stood upon them. Ms. Johnson says that the identity of the murderer may have been determined by a piece of a watch chain which was found in the bed where the Stillinger girls were killed. It had been broken loose and is believed to have been torn by the larger of the girls who is thought to have struggled with her slayer. Quote, no one can explain why an unoccupied bed in the front room has been made by Mrs. Moore and yet never occupied. End quote, continue Miss Johnson. Quote, one theory is that they had expected another party to stay all night with them, but friends Say this is not true, end quote. Miss Moore, the sister, will return to Omaha Saturday. She attended the funeral on Wednesday. Here is a third and final rumor. And this one I actually kind of find silly. And it goes like this. Slayer image in the in eye. Photograph of Iowa murderer is obtained from retina of a girl victim. Now you can see why I think it's silly. Council Bluffs, August 21st, 1912. C. M. Brown of Villisca, Iowa, who is in the city, declares that the detective at Villisca, working to solve the mystery in the recent murder of eight persons in Villisca, has obtained a photograph of the murderer from the retina of one of the Stillinger sisters. The girl circumstances at the time indicated was only one of the eight of all of whom were killed by a hatchet who had woken during the attack. So before we end this episode, we'll just talk a little bit about the house and its renovations. So in 
1868, it was originally built by George Lumius, and then it became the property of the Moors in 1903, where Josiah and his wife lived there until her death nine years later. Uh, after the murders, the house remained in the estate until 1915, where it was purchased by J.H. Eastman. Over the following 90 years, the house had seven additional owners, including the Liska State Savings and Loan, whose company name appears on the title from 1963 to 1971. 1971, the house was titled to Kendrick and Vance, and only a month later retitled to Darwin Kendrick. Mr. Kendrick's name remained on the title of the house until it was sold again to Rick and Vicki Sprogway on July 1st of January 1st of 1994. And it was only a few months later that the real estate agent approached Thornland in hopes of interesting him in purchasing the property. At the time, Lynn owned and operated the Olson Lynn Museum located, located on the town square in downtown Villisca. The house was in danger of being raised and Doran had decided not to purchase it. Doran originally lowballed an offer on the property, told the agent it would expire at midnight on first of the year and promptly forgot about it. Needless to say, he was a little surprised when a call came just before the deadline and he became the proud owner of one of the notorious crime scenes in the country. It took him a few wives to confide in his wife after Martha recovered from the shock. They set about obtaining the necessary funds to restore the home to its original condition at the time of the murders in 1912. In addition to the 13 owner, owners listed on the deed, the house was often a rental property and had a long list of tenants who stayed there for only a very short time. Sometime between 1936 and 1994, the house underwent quite a transfiguration at the front and back porch was closed in, plumbing and electricity were added, and the out buildings were removed and replaced. They used old photographs and began renovations late in 1994. They removed the vinyl siding and the restoring and repainting of the original wood on the outside. The removal of front and back enclosures, the addition of an outhouse and chicken coop in the backyard, and the removal of all electricity and plumbing fixture, fixtures. The pantry in the original house had been converted into a bathroom and was also restored to its original condition. Using testimonies given during the coroner's inquest, grand jury testaments, he placed the Furniture in approximately the same places occupied at the time of the murders. More home was added to the National Registry of Historic Places in 1998 and also received the Preservation is Its Best Award in the mail in a small public category from the Iowa Historic Preservation Alliance in 1997. There's tours of the home, which include a very colorful narrative of the time period of the house, the murders, and the controversy the town found itself embroiled in during the investigation of Frank Jones, one of Villisca's most prominent citizens, and the trial of Reverend Kelly, a willed peeping preacher. The garage was removed to make way for a peg barn that was donated to Darwin by a farmer in 2004, and the finishing touches and walls were added in the summer of 2005. The rafters in the barn had been signed by visitors to the house over the last couple of years. The barn will eventually become a house museum 
has a museum, theater, restrooms, and concession stand. In May of 2004, they hosted a barn raising. Uh, most recent finishings of renovation was the seller of the house. In the past, this part of the house was largely avoided. It was dark and the stairs didn't exist anymore. Most people venturing down there were met by bats. And Darwin had made it into a place where you actually might feel welcome to step into. Well, everyone, that's the end of this week's episode. You'll, like I said, be able to find all the links in the show notes. I am looking to do a question and answer episode next week. So if you have any questions, please feel free to look in the link in the show notes for the links of where you can send them to. I will accept them through email, Instagram, and both the Facebook page and Facebook group, as well as Twitter. So I'd like to have that done and get those in for Monday at the latest as well. As I am going to throw you over to my podcast friend. There's only four of them you have to listen to. So don't be salty and have a great day. Okay? Do you know where Saskatchewan is? Probably not. It's in Canada. If you do, you might know a city named Regina. In Regina, there's a studio. And in that studio, there are, at least once a month, a bunch of skeptical atheist geeks and goofballs who get together to do a podcast. We are the Brainstorm Crew, and we're trying to help spread a bit of reason and critical thinking while still having fun. Never taking things too seriously, but still not accepting everything we're told, we go through different topics, exploring them in depth, and often disagreeing. We try to stick to provable facts, and we never trust a myth. That's why we say we're woo-free since 2013. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker under Brainstorm. Or check out our website, brainstormblog.net. I can't promise you'll always agree with us, but I can promise you'll have fun listening to us. Join Kevin, Jules, and Tim for the nerdiest things that happen each week on the Nerdy Things Podcast. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, it's nerdy things. I am the most nerdiest man in the world. Find us on iTunes or anywhere you get podcasts.